Okay, brethren, uh, recently we were looking at uh, the, the book of Judges in the Old Testament, the story of the very difficult days of about 300, 350 years after the death of Joshua, before we came to the time of the kings like Saul and David and so on. And in that period, uh, lots of trouble, lots of problems. Uh, endlessly, it seems, with the sin cycle going round and round, Israel would go into captivity or into oppression of one sort or another. God would deliver them. As soon as life was comfortable and secure, they sinned again, went back into oppression and on and, and on it went. And then last time around, we looked at a couple of really nasty events, uh, Micah and uh, his idolatry, perhaps representative of the religious state of the land. And of course, the terrible events surrounding Gibeah and the homosexual crowd uh, and the death eventually of the Levites' concubine and all that sort of story. Well, round about that time, it looks like every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That was one of the key problems. Not dissimilar to today, perhaps, <laughs> if you think about it. You know, our nations, whether you live in you know, Austria or France or the USA, Canada, Mexico, here in the UK, and not, not many people have much regard for religion of the Bible uh, and God in any respect. Most people do what seems right. I don't think people necessarily do what they know is wrong. I mean, some do, of course. Uh, but I think an awful lot of people, ordinary people, do what looks like the right thing to do. But there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end of those ways usually is death, right? But back in those days of judges when things were pretty grim and as grim reading, there was at least you know one uh, simple story, which is very much more pleasant, which we'll cover today because it's the same time period, same part of the Bible, basically, which is the book of Ruth. So if you want to find your Bibles and open at uh, the book of Ruth, which you'll find immediately following the book of Judges. That's the clue, right? Now let's start in chapter 1. Makes, makes a sensible place to apparently... This is Ruth and Boaz. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's Ruth and Boaz, who are mice, I would think they are. My lie, mice. My lie, mice. My lie, rice. Mice. My lie. Anyway, whatever they are. <laughs> Boaz and Ruth are the hero and heroine of the story. You probably know that, of course. But anyway, chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Now, it came to pass, here we are, in the days when the judges ruled or governed. So that, that's it. Back in those days that we've read all about. I suspect probably towards the end of that period, that's, that's my guess, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife, and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and uh, remained there. It's ironic in a sense, but the, the name Bethlehem means uh, the house of bread. <laughs> but at this particular time, there was no bread, uh, and uh, at least... The case of Elimelech and his wife and two sons, they moved off to a nearby country of Moab. Um, there might have been others that moved. We, we wouldn't know the rest of the story, but we're going to follow their story somewhat. I think at the same time, many people stayed put. It's one of those things. I mean, we've got that today. People move around across the border from Mexico uh, into the US of A, in, into Europe, <laughs> from North Africa, from the Middle East, from... Afghanistan, other places. Sometimes people are refugees from, from war and conflict, like, say, Ukraine. At other times, and probably more commonly, people are moving for economic reasons. But that's the case here. So not a, not a problem we've not seen before. They move out down, down to Moab. Verses 3 through 5. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilian also died. So the woman, Naomi, survived her two sons and her husband. So not looking too good so far. You move out of Bethlehem to the nearby country of Moab 
Uh, and when you're there, uh, the husband dies first of all, husband and father. So he's, he's Elimelech, he's died. Your two sons get married to local girls and the two sons die, right? Now people look at the names of the sons and think, is, is there something there? Because the name Malon, one of the two sons, means sick. The other son, Kilion, that in Hebrew means wasting away. <laughs> or pining away. It's not, not really great, you know, names. Uh, you know, Elimelech means my God is king. That's okay as a name, you know. And uh, Naomi means pleasant, I believe. But calling your two sons sick and wasting away, <laughs> it's like naming your you know, kids, you know, pleurisy. Or, you know, you meet a young mother Can't one be. day and say, oh, that's a lovely little bouncing boy you got there. What's his name? Oh, his name's Dysentery. Think I'm, Really? <laughs> Does he have a problem with his food? You know, so it's a bit odd. And anyway, they, they live up to or live down to their names, sick and pining, and they're both dead within a few years. So that leaves a bit of a problem because you now get three widows, three widow ladies, Naomi and Orpah and, and Ruth. No, none of them have any others to support them. There are no men around. There are no sons around. And of course, back in those days, and probably even today for that matter, you know, being a, a widow lady with no no children, at least nobody who can earn money, it's, it means you're really leaning on others' charity. I mean, today we got social security, some things like that. Back in those days, not not so much. So, very vulnerable, not a comfortable lifestyle. Let's read on verses six through nine. Then she, Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So the famine was over. And if they stayed put, perhaps things would have been different. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. I think she means that you'll get remarried. Go back home, get remarried, uh, and hopefully you'll find rest in the, the house of your new husband. If these were both young ladies, which I think they were, then that's quite likely to be the outcome. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Seems, of course, they, they did love Naomi. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. Which is certainly a very kind uh, you know, offer. Um, but Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be in future your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Just, you know, raise up, you know, become your husbands in due course when they're 16 or 17 or 18 or 20. Are you going to wait another? <laughs> if a husband tonight, you're going to wait another 20 years, ladies? Of course you're not. I don't, I'm not asking for that. Plus, of course, Naomi has no expectation of having a husband. So just talking theoretically here. Um, no, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Go on, Ruth, go back. You know, this, this, this episode is over. Make your way back home. You know, get remarried. I hope things work out well for you in the future. You're a lovely girl, but adios. But Ruth said, and this is, you know, Ruth's, uh, you know, quite famous sort of vow. It's been turned into to song. You may know that. It's a very well-known passage of Scripture, a very beautiful passage of Scripture. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, 
my God, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord, Jehovah, do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. It's quite an outstanding uh, you know, promise or, or, or vow or commitment. It even includes swapping to the God of Israel from the God, gods of Moab, right? When, verse 18, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, Naomi stopped speaking to her. Right, so that's it's quite quite sort of something, um, and it turns out that's an early introduction to Ruth as a person, and her character, and her virtues. She was actually a very lovely young lady, and Boaz turns out to be a very handsome young man. Boy, well, he's not so young, I think, but we'll get there in due course. Verse nineteen. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi, the name means uh, pleasant. So they're saying, oh, welcome back, pleasant. She said, no, don't, don't call me pleasant. You know, life's been pretty rough since I left here. Call me Mara, meaning bitter, because that's more like it. Uh, interesting, the name Orpah means gazelle, and the name Ruth means friendship. But they all seem quite reasonable names, We're not opposed to Killian and uh, Malon, sickness and disease. Definitely not a good idea to call your children names like, like that. And of course, it's not obviously not the case that God has intervened here and brought disaster on Naomi and her family. But obviously people in those days didn't know a great deal about the nature of God. They didn't have Bibles like you've got, like I've got, right? Uh, you know, the Torah existed back in these days, or at least you know, books of Genesis through to Deuteronomy existed, but you know, handwritten copies. I imagine perhaps only the priests, perhaps some Levites might have a copy. Most people didn't have a Bible. They couldn't read parts of it and, and, and meditate on it and reflect on it. And, and so all it basically, um, Naomi's saying is, you know, life's been rough. You know, for whatever reason, God hasn't looked after me. Well, she's misunderstanding the story a little bit, but that's her, her take on it. Verse 22. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, with her who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest, which is in the spring of the year, all right? It starts round about uh, Passover time, and it runs for a few weeks up to Pentecost, perhaps into early summer. So the barley harvest is mentioned here because not only does it time the story, give us the timing of the story, it's in springtime into early summer, but also the barley harvest is... <laughs> is a key scene of what happens a bit later, right? So let's uh, read chapter 2, and uh, I guess verses 1. <clears throat> there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, thankfully, Boaz's name isn't a bad name. <laughs> Boaz means either a fleetness, as in speed, or strength. In him is strength. So he's a strong or fleet, right? Much better description than dysentery or pleurisy. <laughs> and it says here he's a man of great wealth. Other translations say a man of great uh, uh, nobility, a man of uh, great uh, virtue. Uh, one commentator says that the nearest you can get to it that you and I might understand is, uh, say, a knight, K N I G H T, you know, a knight in shining armor on his white steed. Because the knights of old, at least the better ones, you know, they were, they were men of integrity, men of courage. They were warriors. They would go off and kill dragons, things of that nature. Uh, and they were also typically men of, who were very religious and very humble. So if you think of Boaz as a sort of knight in shining armor type of person, whose name means fleet or strong, there is a two. So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, 
please let me go to the field, remember it's barley harvest time, and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favour. Now the word favour there, if you're reading King James Version, is grace. And it's the word most commonly translated as, you know, grace in the Old Testament, right? So a lot of people who are looking at the book of Ruth try and find, if you like, a spiritual component to it. Some people don't like just reading stories as, as they are superficially and they look for, you know, spiritual truth, spiritual nuggets. You can do that. And if you do do that, many people say, well, in my eyes, when I read the book of Ruth, I see Boaz, the, the man of valor, the noble man, as a picture, a type of Jesus Christ, who will deliver this young woman. And the young woman is a type of the church, you know, believers. And it says here in verse 2, after him in whose sight I may find grace. And of course, Jesus Christ deals with us in grace. So you get these sort of spiritual, you know, lessons, not dismissing them. Um, you can look into that, you know, if, if you so desire. And, and uh, carrying on, and she said to her, go, my daughter. Verse 3, then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. You're allowed in those days, if you're a poor person, to go into a field where people are working and you know, chopping down and all the rest of it. You're allowed to go behind them and pick up any bits that have fallen in the field, right? You're not allowed to go and actually reap with the reapers. That's a job for people who will be contracted. But you can come along behind and bits that have fallen on the ground, the odd grape over there, piece of grain over there, whatever it might be, you can pick it up. And that's, that's permissible. That's actually required in the law to give poor people the chance to, to work because you have to go out and work for it. But you can work and you get you know, some type of reward. It wouldn't be a huge amount because you can only pick up the bits that have been you know, dropped. And if people are very good at the reaping stage, they won't be dropping too much. But you still pick up bits and pieces here and there. At the end of the day, you might have a little bag full of bits you've picked up, you know, for your evening meal, etc. So that's sort of the idea. Verse 3, Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. And you think, she just happened? It just happened. So there's fields all around Bethlehem. People are out there, busy time of year. Lots of folk out in the fields bringing the harvest while it was still available. And she just inadvertently, accidentally, coincidentally, <laughs> ends up in the field of Boaz. Yeah, well, I suspect a little bit more to it than just coincidence. Let's read verses 4 through 9. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, Jehovah be with you. And they answered him, Jehovah bless you. Which is interesting, just in passing. You know, how many CEOs today or, you know, owners of businesses walk into their employees and say, God bless you all, employees. That might happen somewhere. But, uh, you know, this is a knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. This is a man of valor. This is a man who clearly is uh, a godly man, right? And he actually blesses his employees when he sees them, right? Verse 5, And Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? It's not a huge city. This is a yeah, decent-sized town, and Boaz would know most people because he's a wealthy man, a man of valor. He put his eyes open. Hang on, who's, who's that there? And the servant who was in charge of the reaper's answer and said, It's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. I guess a sort of shelter from the sunshine. Perhaps you can get a bit of shade in there for a while. It gets too hot for you. Uh, verse 8, Then Boaz has said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So, 
at this stage he doesn't really know the, the young woman other than it's been told it's the young woman who came with Naomi that's all he knows about her so far um, but he's obviously very generous right very courteous uh, young lady uh, you stay behind my folk I've told the young men not to harass you in any way I don't want you wandering off into any other fields where things might not be of high standard you stick with my ladies you, you glean behind them okay and uh, very good. Verse 10 through 12. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favour, or grace, same word, in your eyes, that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And she knows she's not, not native to, to Bethlehem. She's not, a, she's not a Jew. She's from you know Moab. She's conscious of that and hears this very wealthy nobleman who owns his field and can employ perhaps dozens of young men and, uh, and reapers and he's taken time to tell her to make sure you go up and take a drink from our vessels you know, and stay with, stay with us, don't go anywhere else young lady and Boaz answered and said to her it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother so I guess her father and mother, one assumes, are still alive. So she's literally left her own home, her, her god and goddesses, Moab, and, and she's gone with Naomi. It says, And you've come to a people whom you did not know before. Jehovah, repay your work, and a full reward be given you by Jehovah, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. So he's heard about her. This is the first time he's actually come across her. But he knows the story. He knows she's been extremely loyal to one of his extended family, Naomi, right? Uh, and, uh, and he respects her character. And he knows quite a bit of the story. And, and uh, he really wants to bless her. He says there, may God bless you for taking care of Naomi, one of my extended family. Thank you for that. God bless you for that. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, so I guess lunchtime arrives, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So he looks out for her at lunchtime. She's working hard in the fields. She's picking up little bits and pieces here and there. Uh, she doesn't know people too well. And he says, up here, top table, right? Eat the bread that we've got, specially prepared. Dip your piece of bread in the vinegar, yes. which uh, is, is pretty good. Um, that's... Um, Oh, I've missed out a couple of verses, yeah, have I? Verse oh, yeah. 13. So verse 13. She said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord. That's grace again. For you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. And then comes lunchtime and he says, Come up, dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. Well, I've, I've been to quite a few pleasant restaurants where early on, before the main meal comes, you get lovely bread, not like... When well, you get in America, ugh, terrible <laughs> stuff, most of it. But you get lovely bread, you know, thick, crunchy, delicious bread. And you get a little bowl of, you know, awesome. balsamic vinegar, yeah. typically, a little bowl of olive oil. And you just duke and suk. You dip your bread in the vinegar and the olive oil, eat it. It's marvelous. And uh, sometimes I eat so much of that, yeah. I've got no room for the <laughs> steak and chips when they arrive. So anyway, she's, she's called up to the front. And he says, you know, dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, that's young ladies, and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Looks like for her mother-in-law. And when she rose up to glean in the after, you know, after lunch, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also, let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So he's, he's got to be his way to be you know, really helpful and, and, and generous to, to this you know, young, young woman. He says, even if she comes right up among you, <laughs> uh, let her do that, right? Don't criticize her. And by the way, while you're at it, guys, make sure that you drop copious amounts of grain on the ground. Don't just leave it to pick up a piece here and another piece five feet away, right? Make sure that you, you know, drop a bit here, drop a bit there, 
so that she can more easily uh, accumulate more. So he's extraordinarily generous. Uh, and I guess he doesn't really know her well at this stage, so you can't say at this stage that he's got romantic attractions. He might have, right? But at this stage, it's safer to say that he's just a very nice guy, right? Uh, and of course, uh, you can see here that you know, he's, he's a rich person and acts in a righteous manner. Uh, Ruth is a very poor person, but acts in a righteous manner. And that's the key. It's not whether you're rich or poor that's important in God's eyes. It's whether you're righteous, right? Obviously, it's better <laughs> to be rich and righteous, I suspect, <laughs> for most of us, right? Because then you can do good things. You know, if, if, if Boaz was poor, he could hardly have looked after Ruth in this manner, could he? <clears throat> Verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And I've read a few commentaries, a bit confusing in places, to what an ephah might, might look like, but the best guess seems to be, at a minimum, about 30 pounds weight of barley. It could be as much as 50 pounds, although I think she'd need pretty big muscles to carve that lot home. But per perhaps 30 pounds weight of, of barley, Effectively, it was about uh, a week's wages because you would use what you would use, then you could sort of sell or trade the surplus. So the equivalent of a week's wages, which she'd earned in one day because of the generosity of Boaz and his team leaving stuff for her. 18. And of course, you can see there, by the way, that, that uh, Ruth must be a fairly good worker, hard worker, not just sort of standing at the side of the field you know, looking into her, doing a selfie or two for her, <laughs> for her social media a bit later in the day. Right? This is me in the field. This is me. See me eating uh, lunch with Boaz. Right? She's out working. Hence, she's got a week's wages almost in one day. Then she took it, verse 18, and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. Now it's lunchtime. It must be a specially tasty type of grain they had for lunch. So she's eaten enough uh, with Boaz. Now she's given some to her mother-in-law as a, sort of a bit of a treat. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. Because, you know, <laughs> what? I probably thought you'd come back with a little bag that might allow us to eat overnight, but you brought back you know, a ton of stuff. What, what happened there? So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I worked today is uh, Boaz. And uh, Naomi recognizes, uh, ooh, well, that's interesting. So Naomi said to her daughter, verse 20, blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Which turns out, that phrase, close relative, turns out to be a technical term. In Hebrew, it's goel, often written G-O apostrophe E-L, goel or goel. And it's, it's not just a a relative, like, you know, your brother or your nephew or your cousin or your uncle, whatever. It's more than that. A goal is a kinsman who is in a legal position to, to intervene in your life, who can be a guardian of you and your family, who can be a redeemer if you or your family is in trouble. So a close relative or a goal is a kinsman who can technically, legally redeem you from trouble. And a lot of Bibles refer to kinsman hyphen redeemer. So Boaz turns out to be a kinsman redeemer, not just a relative, but this technically very close relative. He can, he can intervene in family affairs as a sort of legal guardian almost. So let's read verses 21 through 23. 20. Verse 20. Then Naomi said, I thought I'd just read verse 20. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, 21. <laughs> Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, That's good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. 
might not be as courteous, might even be troublesome, some of them. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt in the evenings with her mother-in-law. So it looks like at this stage Naomi's spirits are lifting a bit because it was good. You stick with uh, Boaz, he's, a, he's a, a goal, a kinsman redeemer of ours. You stay with him and he'll look after you, right? But obviously, um, eventually the harvest comes to an end. It lasts a number of weeks. If it lasts up to Pentecost, that would be about seven-ish weeks, uh, possibly a bit longer with the wheat harvest into early summer. But at some point, the harvest will come to a conclusion. And then you know people will obviously go back to their normal so jobs, they'll scatter here and there. Boaz might move on and do other projects he's, he's got charge of. In which case, uh, you know, Ruth's position will come to an end. It's been pretty good up to now. You know, super blessed. You know, if she's been earning a week's wages <laughs> per day, <laughs> then at the end of the seven or eight weeks, she's probably earned the equivalent of an annual salary, right? Great for her and her mum, but great as it is, it still leaves a widow and another widow lady and a very uncertain future. So um, Naomi can see this as a potential problem and decides that she wants to work things out. So chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Not a pub. That's where you thresh barley. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. You shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all you say to me, I will do. So Naomi, you can see what the plan is here. <laughs> Naomi wants to get security for her, for her daughter-in-law, which is good. I mean, that's, that's about decent. Uh, you know, uh, Ruth has looked after Naomi left her own family and come to, to Bethlehem. Uh, Naomi, no doubt, is hugely grateful and wants to do something in return, try and sort out Ruth's future. Ruth's only a young woman at this stage, probably no more than 25, 26, 27, somewhere in that sort of region. So Naomi thinks, right, let's see if we can move this along a little bit. And so let's, so let's have a shower uh, and not yourself, Get your finest perfume, you know, your, your Dior Eau de Parfum, spray it on, get your finest outfit and put them on and head off to the threshing floor. Of course, there's no way that, that, uh, that Boaz would have seen her looking smart. <laughs> He's normally seeing her in, her in the field with her work clothes, you know, her dungarees on, you know, scarf around her head, face perhaps flushed with the effort of working and dust all over her nose. That's how he, he's seen her so far. So if she's all scrubbed up, you know, smelling of nice anointment or ointment or perfume and with a really nice uh, outfit on, right, he'll be no doubt properly stunned. And in verse 5 she says, all you've said to me, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do that, which, you know, fair enough. Uh, she perhaps understands, <laughs> taking her mom, mother-in-law's advice. Verse 6, so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, I guess a glass or two of wine perhaps, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Uh, again, perhaps security as well. There might be rogues around even in these you know, days, you know, the days of the judges were like, so he's going to sleep you know, by his produce, keep an eye on it. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? Of course, 
<laughs> you know, it's night time. It's dark in the threshing floor. All he knows is a body by my feet. It could have been a grizzly bear, perhaps ambling past. But uh, he, perhaps he can make out as a woman there. Who, who on earth are you? So she answered, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a Goel, a kinsman redeemer. Right? Which is, you know, uh, take me under your wing, for you're a close relative. That, that means basically marry me. <laughs> That's the, the sort of the custom of the time. Um, so marry me. Not sure you're expecting that at midnight. Young woman making a, an offer of marriage to him. Um, <clears throat> reading verses 10 and 11. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. Which makes me think Boaz probably wasn't a young man, because he's saying well, you, you've not chased after the young men. Right, so that sort of to me at least implies that Boaz can't be considered a young man. If the young men are, you know, 15, 20, 25 ish, then perhaps Boaz is 40, 45, whatever, but not a young man. And now, my daughter, verse 11, do not fear, I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know you are a virtuous woman, which is. Pretty good endorsement. Everybody here knows that you're a virtuous woman. Uh, you know, Ruth, it's a, you're, you're a woman of, of noble character. Everybody knows that, which is you know pretty good to be known that way. It's the same word you'll find in Proverbs 31, where you've got the description of uh, you know uh, the um, the perfect woman, perfect wife. Virtuous and there in Proverbs 31:10 it says, "Who can find a virtuous wife?" Right, same word, virtuous. So she was apparently. You know, a type of Proverbs 31 woman. Um, but there's a little potential hiccup. Verse 12. Now, it is true that I am a, a goal, a kinsman redeemer. However, there is a relative closer than I. <laughs> and, and he has priority, effectively. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a kinsman redeemer for you, good. Let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Now lie down until morning. So it turns out that, oops, not quite a straight road yet because uh, Boaz is more than happy to, to marry this young woman. She has proposed after all and reminded him that he is a kinsman redeemer. He has certain you know, formal obligations within the extended family of Elimelech. So she lay, verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning and she arose before one could recognize another. So, you know, about day, before daybreak, probably. Then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Still got to protect her reputation a little bit. She has spent the night, <laughs> you know, lying close to, to a man. Then that might just dent reputation with some of the old busybodies of the town. Verse 15, also he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when, he, when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. And then she went into the city. So that's quite a good weight. I mean, his generosity is pretty consistent, you know, right? Although now perhaps he's thinking, oh, my fiancé, <laughs> give her plenty more, right? When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, the mother-in-law said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, and she said, These six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. So he is quite a generous guy, and then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter you know, this, this day. So he is you know, clearly a man of action. Uh, Naomi knows that. He's got a bit of a reputation, man of valor, the knight in shining armor sort, uh, very generous, uh, uses God's name to bless his employees, his servants and so on. So, you know, well-known, good sort and a man of action. So she says, OK, you might be a bit anxious, uh, Ruth, but let's just, you know, wait, let things take their course because there's another kinsman of Demer who has some precedence. 
over Boaz. So let's carry on with chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, the gate of the cities in those days, be where you did lots of legal work and uh, uh, business and trade and so on. And behold, the close relative, the goal, the kinsman redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he, Boaz, took ten men of the elders of the city uh, and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So they quite a gathering getting assembled there by the gate. Verse 3, then he said to the close relative, the, the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold, or I think many translations say, is selling the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next so after you. Right? So, the, and, and, and the guy says, I will redeem it. End of verse uh, 4 there. So basically, you know, Boaz looks like he's being clever, shrewd. I think he is. He says, uh, okay, friend who is not named anywhere, uh, you know, uh, Naomi, part of our family, is selling the land that belonged to Elimelech and perhaps the homes and dwellings on it. Um, you have the right to intervene and, and to acquire that, to redeem that land. Do you want to? <laughs> and I guess for most people, it's like, oh, well, get more land, get more property. Extend my land holdings, become a bigger landowner. Oh, yeah, that sounds pretty attractive. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, don't worry. It's, I'm on it, right? But, of course, Boaz has <laughs> been holding back some of the story <coughs> and says, uh, okay, verse 5. Um, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabites, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Ah, now this is a bit different. Um, you don't only acquire the land, you also acquire a wife and a mother-in-law and your wife is not even Jewish. She's a Moabites and moreover, part of your duty is to raise up children to the dead person. Right? So it's like, uh, well, and at that point, uh, this unnamed person has second thoughts. Piece of land, done. A wife? I mean, a wife, not of my personal choosing. A mother-in-law? What? Really? And this, 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 this is more by tense. Uh, and if I have children, those children will be children to take over that land, not, not my land that I already possess. Oh, hang on a second, right? <laughs> Verse 6, And the close relative said, I cannot. <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm not going to happen. I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You know, he wants his children to inherit his land and pass that down to their children and so on. He doesn't want to get diverted now onto a different, different you know, genealogy. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I, I, cannot, I cannot do it. Now this was a custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything you know, legal. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in the old days. Because nowadays we just shake hands. Well, of course you don't. <laughs> you have a bunch of lawyers that write out thousand page contracts and get signed and sealed and all the rest of it. But in those days you just took off your shoe and Handed it over, apparently. How did you get out? Who's only one sandal? Maybe, maybe they gave you a sandal back to you. Oh, I think they probably <clears> did. Yeah. You wouldn't really want a second hand or a second foot sandal, would you? <laughs> Therefore, verse 8, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. You know, I'm out. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and, and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's 
and all that was Killian's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabites, um, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. So Boaz steps up. He's no problems with buying the land to add to his existing land holdings. He's got no problem with, um, with taking uh, Ruth to be his, his wife. Obviously, he's quite fond of her. <laughs> that sort of comes through reading between the lines, so he's probably quite delighted with, uh, with Ruth the Moabites. Uh, and he's happy, right? Verse 11, And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. Jehovah, make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. Because uh, Rachel and Leah were the wives of, uh, of Jacob. So, you know, the sons of Jacob, you know, Reuben and Judah and sundry others came from these two young ladies. doesn't mention the two uh, concubines, I guess they were. But may your family be big and, and productive and prosperous, just like the family, the brought about Israel and may you prosper in Ephratha and be famous in Bethlehem may your house be like the house of Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which Jehovah will give you from this young woman so standard sort of blessing in those days may God give you a big family right uh, verse 13 so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife so all's well that ends well. Naomi is obviously going to be delighted because she was concerned about her daughter-in-law, still a young woman with no clear future. Now she can look and see that my daughter-in-law, Ruth, has got married now to one of the finest men in the country, you know, Boaz, you know, the great man of valor and wealth and generosity, a really wonderful guy. She's married. That's fantastic. You know, that's a relief. Um, and he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative. And that's, of course, Boaz. And uh, may he be to you a restorer, and may his name be famous in Israel. Well, it is. And may he be to you a restorer of life. Talking I think of the son now. Uh, and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. They all recognize that Ruth is an outstanding woman. Boaz is an outstanding man. This horrible time of the judges when there's just you know, wickedness and anarchy everywhere. This was a you know, beautiful little story of romance and, and generosity and, and goodness. With a terrible backdrop around it. Verse 15. May he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, in a sense. And they called his name Obed, which means, I think, a serve or servant. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Oh, that's quite important, right? <laughs> because David, after all, is uh, the greatest king of Israel, other than, of course, the Lord Jesus. But Jesus is, of course, the son of David. So we're talking of, you know, King David being the man, Jesus Christ, the son of David. And, of course, Bethlehem is where this was taking place. Is where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. David is of Bethlehem. And there you've got uh, Obed, then Jesse, then David. It's only about, you know, three generations. So effectively, you know, Ruth and Boaz are the great grandparents of King David of Israel. Not only a pleasant interlude in the story of the judges, but also it just captures that part of the genealogy, taking us from the days of the judges down to the immediate antecedents of King David. Verse 18. Now this is the genealogy of Perez, Perez begot Hezron, who begot Ram, who begot Abinadab, who begot Nashon, who begot Salmon. 
begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. And of course, this is not a part of getting the reader ready for the story of David, because next book is Samuel. You'll probably see that across the page. First book is Samuel. Samuel is the last of the judges. And Samuel is the judge who anoints King Saul, who of course flops, and then King David. So we go from, you know, Ruth to David in no time at all, right? Marvellous. And not only all of that, um, but even if you go forward, you know, to the book of Matthew, I'm not going to go there, but Matthew chapter 1, verse 5 gives you the genealogy, well, Matthew 1 gives you the genealogy of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and in among that, you have the story of Boaz. Well, let's go there. I've got a couple of minutes left. So Matthew chapter 1. I'll just Twitter on too warm to Twitter on much, so I'll be. Uh, <laughs> it's 84 in here. That is warm enough. So, Matthew 1, and uh, let's just pick up in verse 4. Matthew 1, verse 4. Ram begot Abinadab. Just read that. Abinadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Boaz and Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. Now look at verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So that little story of Ruth there, which is a very pleasant story. I remember the first time I read it, I'd been reading the Bible from Genesis all the way sort of through, uh, I think it was 15, 16 at the time, something like that. And I read the book of Judges and I was utterly depressed. <laughs> Such a miserable book. You know, sort of uh, these homosexual riots, chopping up concubines, sending pieces around the countryside with the Royal Mail, um, judges everywhere, the people endlessly going back into oppression and hard times. I read all that a lot and just think, my word, I am in despair. And then, you know, of course, the next book you read is Ruth. It's like, oh, my word, what a relief. <laughs> a few moments of pleasantness and a nice story with some nice people after that lot of the judges, it was a wonderful story, and I still do enjoy reading it. Okay, that's us uh, today, a little bit earlier, so um, that's us concluding today's Bible study.